y'all. We got a hot, hot show today, man, and I'm excited to have these young men in the building, man. Uh, Dr. Gary Wilkes, the CEO of Tesh Action Clinic, and also Dr. Chip Riggins, y'all. He's the director of Region 3 of the Louisiana Department of Health, y'all. First of all, uh, Dr. Chip, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? Thank you for having us. Hey. hey. I'm just excited, man, when I got the call. Um about that you guys are going to be coming and chopping it up with my peoples, man. I say, wow, that is big because we've been getting a lot of information. And, um, you know, we just want to make sure that, you know, this information that we're getting, especially to the public, uh, is, is, is facts, you know, and right. So um, I definitely appreciate you taking the time out of your day, sir, uh, to come on through and chop it up with me, man. So um, welcome to the show. Thank you again. Thanks for having us. <clears throat> it's a great time to be getting the word out there. So thank you again. That's what's up. Now, Doc, let me ask you something. Left-wing media... Uh, they swear that the sky is falling about uh, COVID-19 and right-wing media uh, claims that it's not far removed from being a hoax. Uh, can you please state the facts on the COVID-19? Well, make no mistake about it. This is a, this is a pandemic. This is, this, is, this is not the 1918 pandemic. That's the one we kind of worried about. But this is definitely the pandemic of our generation. It's the worst I've seen in my 30-year career as a public health physician. And we got to take it very, very seriously because this, while it's not the worst case scenario that, uh, that, that public health docs worry about, this is able to bring us down. It's able to bring our healthcare institutions down. It's a very capable virus. It's already killed a lot of folks. So make no mistake about it. It is a pandemic and, and it's going to take all of us. We're going to have to continue to fight. It's going to be a continual thing. That's what's up, Doc. Also, uh, we're hearing that the virus is now attacking uh, younger people, 18 and older. Uh, why do you think the demographics change? Well, <clears throat> that's very, that data is very strong and very clear now that uh, not, not just the, the, the young folks, the 18 to 21 demographic especially has, has had a, a, a real increase. Some of that has to do with graduation and parties and celebration, and we've been cooped up for a long time. It's completely, you know, it's it's not it's not completely unexpected. It's 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 a group that feels invincible, but what what we need to remember is that while in most of them, not all of them, some of them have had very serious disease, but in most of them, it's very mild. Statistics are now showing that almost a third of us with COVID-19 have no symptoms whatsoever. And that means that's, that's why we're all masking up, y'all, because if, you, if, a, if one out of three people has the virus and can transmit it but feels perfectly fine, mm -hmm. then we all got a mask because you don't know when you're that person. Yeah. You don't know that that's you. And we don't want to expose the folks in our community who are at higher risk Especially our nursing homes, been a lot of talk about that. Especially our assisted living facilities, especially folks with disabilities and and with chronic illness. So we're seeing that as well. We got to protect the most vulnerable uh, around us, and that means really everybody taking taking the precautions that that uh, that are recommended right now. So it's a great time to to have this discussion and to to really talk about the importance of of social distancing, of masking up, of washing our hands. This is our new normal, but this is the foundation of how we're going to prevent this disease. That's what's up, that's what's up, Doc. Also, does this virus leave any kind of scar tissues in the lungs? Well, <clears throat> not only that, it's taking people who've had this disease, it's really leaving a mark on them. Uh, very Many of them say it's one of the scariest experiences they've had. I don't know if you've ever been short of breath and not been able to to, to catch your breath, but that's a very anxiety-producing uh, feeling, and it's very scary. And so, yes, uh, it's taken folks <clears throat> a long time to recover their respiratory function. Uh -huh. If you talk to somebody who's had the disease and had it seriously, they'll tell you that they're they're weak for a long time, um, uh, and and. Uh, we don't just worry about the lung damage. This virus is capable of causing increased uh, clotting and problems like heart attacks and strokes are also uh, coming up and those definitely leave a mark. Uh, wow. You don't recover from uh, a, a stroke or a heart attack uh, like you do from the flu. So long lasting effects, we don't know how long they are. That's one of the reasons I'm here today is because Dr. Wilkes is, 
is working on a study to, to really try to scientifically measure the long-term effects of this virus. I think it's gonna be real important to this community and to the state what comes out of this study because we honestly don't know. This is a new virus. We never saw it before. So we don't know what to, what to expect long term. This study is going to follow people for five years. And, uh, and so we'll have a much better idea and be able to answer your question about things like scarring after this study is done. All right. That's what's up. Uh, so um, the numbers that the Louisiana Department of Health uh, updates daily, are these duplicate numbers or new cases? In other words, if someone tested positive in March, then they recovered, but recently tested positive again, are they counted twice? Also, uh, if someone tested a month ago and they weren't, weren't positive, but recently tested positive again, are they counted twice? <clears throat> well, let me repeat again that, that this virus is asymptomatic. It, it affects people, it infects people, uh, without causing symptoms at least a third of the time. At least a, a third of people who get the infection show no symptoms whatsoever. So we have always known that the testing that we're doing is only showing the tip of the iceberg. It's only, it's only showing the worst of the worst. It's an underestimate of the total number of cases in the community because many people are, have very mild symptoms mm -hmm. and never get tested. Wow. Many more than are getting tested are not being tested. So keep that in mind when you hear that there could be duplicates. And obviously there could be because these, this is an automated process. Many labs are testing. Many hospitals are testing. We have different commercial labs that, that are doing this test. They are all required to report a positive to the health department. And, and if you... Uh, if, if, if you get a test at different places done by different labs, there's a chance that the automated system that's designed to pick up a duplicate could miss it. You might use your initials one time. Today, your, 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 your main name or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, I, I get you, where you're going. You <laughs> use your middle initial, and, and it, it, it's possible that, that some duplicates are there. But again, I think the bigger, the bigger thing to remember is that, that the statistics that we see, we know and have always known, are just the tip of the iceberg of how much disease we have in the community. It's an indicator. The number of deaths that we have actually coincides pretty well with the number of cases that we show for St. Mary Parish. Uh, from what we know, the number of deaths, the relationship to that, to, to the total number of cases is not out of proportion. Uh, real people are dying from this disease and, and you know, I, I know there's probably some cases where um, uh, uh, cases could be, could be counted twice, but I don't think that's what we need to focus on. What we need to focus on is what's going on in the community, what's the level of transmission, how well are our efforts to fight this virus working? That's what's up, that's what's up. Do you think school will reopen? Well, I'm pretty sure it will. Um, it, it's, it's a question of what phase will we be in and how many hoops are schools going to have to jump through? Uh, our whole community is having to get used to there's no perfect way to prevent this disease. Everybody in society is susceptible to it. It's obviously pretty easy to spread. And we, we, we are, even our schools are not going to be able to, to, to prevent transmission, just like our nurses, nursing homes couldn't transmit, uh, couldn't prevent transmission. Our jails cannot perfectly trans prevent transmission. That's because a third of us have it and have no symptoms. No fever, no cough, feeling fine. Wow. So schools are going to be faced with the same challenge. Is, uh, and, and, the, and the young people also unlikely to have uh, symptoms. So it, it, we're going to be up against it as a community. We're going to have to be tolerant. There's no perfect way to prevent it. Cases are going to happen. It's just Let's get them back in school because it's causing a chain reaction of other problems not to have the kids in school. Definitely. And some are falling behind. Yeah. Some don't have food. They have food insecurity uh, or other challenges. Their parents really very much to return to work. They need the kids to be back in school. So as a community, we got to help the schools be successful. That's what's up. Now, we all know how big high school football is, uh, especially around our area. Uh, do you think high school football will be canceled or postponed? <coughs> Well, 
I think that's going to depend on the phase. And as we were talking about, if Louisiana keeps heading in the wrong direction, I think that the, the governor may have to make a decision about what phase we're in by that time, by the time school starts. That's going to have more to do with it. I'm as worried about the people in the stands, honestly, as, as the student athletes. I think that the question is, are we really able to social distance at those contact sports? There's a lot of, there's a, a lot of droplet spread going on right there. So um, it's not what I would like to see as a public health doc, but I also realize how important it is to the community and to these young people to stay engaged. So it's a balancing act. It's can we get away with it? If we can have, if we can have sports and we don't see a spike in, in cases, uh, uh, great. Yeah. If we see a spike in cases and we got to back off and everybody's got to know, we're going to go forward, we're going to take two steps forward, or we may have to take a step backwards. But let's just be flexible. That's what's up. Also in the building, Dr. Gary Willis, the CEO of Tesh Ashley Clinic. Uh, Doc, first of all, let me just say congratulations on uh, Governor John Bell Edwards uh, being a member selective of the committee. Explain to my peoples about that. Well, the governor uh, recognized that, uh, uh, you know, we saw nationwide, but particularly in Louisiana, that the COVID uh, uh, infection was uh, affecting peoples of color more, uh, uh, more than uh, the general population. And in that vein, he created an equity task force. So we've been challenged with uh, developing strategies for increased testing, okay. as well as uh, measures and getting uh, uh, correct information, like you said. And I appreciate what you're doing uh, out to the public, particularly to, uh, the minority community, because there were a lot of myths, a lot of misinformation, a lot Yay. of uh, bad information that was being spread out there. And <clears throat> let me just take a moment to express uh, my gratitude to Dr. Chip Briggins and how fortunate we are and blessed we are to have some of this with his public health expertise in our region because Region 3 has been a leader and uh, the coalition that he's put together and the data that he's put together has been invaluable in helping to guide us. Um, uh, you know, just a couple of things. You know, uh, there's an old expression, you can't manage what you can't measure. Uh -huh. So, yeah, testing is extremely important. And uh, just as he said, we don't know the long-term side effects. And that's, uh, you know, people think that, well, I'm young and I'm invincible and mm -hmm. I get something and I'm, I'm, I'm over it. Or we don't know that. We, you won't know that until we start seeing trends over time. You know, there was a condition called rheumatic fever back in the day. People would get over it. And then they would later have on have problems with uh, heart valve disease. Mm -hmm. You know, so the things that affect you that you don't know in the short term that we have to follow. Um, and so, you know, we have to make, make sure that the best thing in anything, early detection is the best for the prevention. We know that's true in cancer screening. You can use that same analogy here. If you identify people that you know have a problem, isolate them, quarantine them, and like the Riggins staff has done an outstanding job of contact tracing, mm -hmm. running it down, isolating people, separating people so you don't spread it. You know, and that's the, 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 the big issue is that he mentioned it, and I agree with everything he said. A third of people are asymptomatic. And they don't even, even know that they have. They don't even know it, and they're passing it on to their parents and grandparents and vulnerable populations. And, you know, it, I can only imagine how horrible someone would feel if they know that they were the carrier and their parent or grandparent got affected because of them. And that's what we want to put in young people's minds, you know. Don't be selfish. And, and we want people to own their own health. So sure. do the things you know that you need to do to protect you and protect you from hurting someone else. That's what's up. Did y'all hear about the story? I think it was in uh, Oklahoma where uh, they're doing like competitions to catch the virus. Yeah, I was very disappointed. I heard, uh, I think uh, there was an incident at my uh, old Younger alma folks, mater. younger folks though. My old alma mater, Tulane. So it wasn't just high school that's just totally unacceptable yeah I mean, I totally like unacceptable and just selfish yeah you know the first rule of medicine is to do no harm and the way you do no harm is to do no harm to yourself and others and i think that's the message that we want to continue to you know make to the public please wear a mask wear a mask as a sign of love yeah that means that you love yourself and you love your family and you love your community and your neighbors so there's no downside to wearing a mask. There is no downside to, to wearing a mask. You know, and um, uh, we can't emphasize that enough. That's what's up. I try to tell a lot of my listeners, um, we had a motto over here, if you love me, don't hug me. 
Yeah, so that's our motto. If you love me, don't hug me. So we've like been uh, pushing that a lot and also um, uh, just trying to encourage everybody to definitely uh, put on their masks, like you said, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but now we're going to take some questions from the Facebook uh, family, our Facebook family. Uh, we encourage them to tune in. Uh, Ms. Cass, did you have any questions? Yeah, we have a question for Dr. Riggins. Okay. Um, why isn't it mandatory for uh, everyone to take a test? And why, why won't the federal government or the state pay for that? <clears throat> well, that's, that's a really good question, and I'm glad I got the opportunity to talk a little bit about testing because there's a lot of confusion out there, and there's there's a shortage right now. If you haven't, if you've tried to get a test lately, you know that in the last couple of weeks, because of this resurgence statewide and because of our neighbor states having a big surge themselves, our, our laboratories have fallen behind. And we got to take care of our laboratories just like we do other parts of our healthcare system, because right now they're working on uh, uh, just trying to keep up with the with the demand. So uh, it it is in short supply. Labs labs. Uh, uh, are out there it would be it would be ridiculous if we can't meet the demand today for us to require more folks to get tested when we can't meet the demand just of people that are concerned or have symptoms today with what little access they have we can't make that worse and and that's why we wanted to also get the word out to businesses if you own a business and you're able to be open right now we want you to be successful but we'd appreciate if folks would use the CDC guidance and let their employees come back to work if they had symptoms and they've been symptom free for, um, they've been fever free for three days uh, and it's been 10 days since they, they got sick, they can safely come back to work. They don't need a test. Uh, to sure. require a test for people that have recovered is just making that problem a lot worse and making the shortage of testing a lot worse so if you're a contact and you've been put in quarantine because a family or a friend was a, a case themselves then you're gonna have to serve your 14 days in quarantine and try to stay out of circulation and a test is not going to shorten that because people believe well if I get tested a couple times and I'm negative right. I'm sure I can get out of quarantine early yeah. no no because if you're negative today it doesn't tell me that you're still not going to develop COVID somewhere in that two-week period, and we know the incubation period for COVID-19 is four to 14 days. That's why the two-week quarantine, and it, it doesn't make sense, but I'll say it again. If you have disease, you could be back at work in 10 days in most cases because the fever lasts just a couple of days. You, you, don't, you don't feel so great, but then you, then you come back. You could be back at work at 10 days in 10 days. Your family members from the last day that they were contact to you, they're in quarantine for two full weeks. So they can't go back to work as soon as the case. Uh -huh. And that's counterintuitive. That, that just doesn't seem to make sense. But that's because of the incubation period. And, and we know that some people have spread the disease as late as 14 days after. So uh, anyway, when you do go back to work, wear a mask. Uh, this, this is why this is important because there's no there's no perfect solution here. We don't think that 100% uh, of folks uh, are, are uh, free of the COVID-19 virus at 10 days. We just know that if they wear a mask, their chance of spreading it to others uh, seems to be almost zero. And that's all we can hope for, is to get it down as low as we can go. Some people low. say, so what? Um, so you're in quarantine for 10 days. That's the same thing as the flu. So why make the big deal about the virus when you got to be at home and away from people if you have the flu? Well, we do like to be people to stay home. And the, the policies like uh, uh, allowing employees who are sick to stay home when they have the flu, that's, that's near and dear to my heart as a public health doc because I've promoted that policy for many years. Now, COVID is reinforcing that having a policy like that where you don't force people to work sick uh, is a good one as far as preventing uh, transmission of things like flu. So uh, I think that's important. I think that uh, uh, the, the, uh, th these other issues like uh, paid leave for health care or being able to get a test, having insurance to be able to see a doctor when you're sick, these are all related to, to, to being able to control uh, this virus and to 
prevent the severe consequences because we do not want people staying at home right now if they're having other problems. We want them to know the hospital's open, right. our clinics are open, if you're having problems, don't fail to come in right now because you're worried about COVID. Go ahead and get your issues taken care of because we don't want to make this problem any worse than, than it already is. Thank you. We had another question. Um, All right, we got another question some, on Facebook. Okay, some people that go to Walmart get frustrated because they have their mask on, but they see big stores that aren't really enforcing wearing masks. And is there anything the governor can do or the local police can do to give these people a ticket or something to make them wear a mask? Well, um, I said this in a in a blog recently, and I'll say it again here. I don't. I know we public health doesn't want to be the mask police. I know the police don't want to be the mask police. Uh, as a community, we're going to have to turn that equation around and thank people for masking up, like DJ Fab is right now. I'm thanking him for masking up right now because he's protecting me. Yeah. And we got to get better. Thank you guys, because I mean, y'all walked in with y'all masks, and so y'all protected me. Well, what we what we do well is uh, it, we we're we're known for our friendliness down here. We don't confront each other well when you see somebody that's not wearing a mask. But we can do the reverse, which is thank those that we see doing the right thing, thank them, uh, let others hear it. Hopefully that catches on, because as Dr. Wilt said, that's the neighborly thing. That's the uh, that that's what we're doing to protect each other right now is um, uh, is is masking and respecting those dots on the floor uh, using the sanit the, the 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 disinfectant that's that's made available to us in these facilities not only protecting their employees but protecting the other customers that are trying to use that service we want everything to stay open but it's really just going to take everybody to do that and I'm seeing signs that some businesses uh, are having to close because they got too many staff uh, ill. Wow. So. That's right. Well, we all know that, uh, you know, doing these things such as our uh, social distance, our uh, wearing masks, we all know that it works because that's what got us to go to phase two, right? That's right. So now we're going backwards, but it just shows that we got comfortable. You know what I'm saying? As in uh, with the doors opening uh, to America. And, you know, like I said, we got comfortable, but I feel like we have to go back to when, like, when it first hit. You know, to where we wear those masks and 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 uh, continue to practice social distance and stuff like that, uh, because we saw the numbers go down to where we was able to go into phase two. You get what I'm saying? Right. So now I feel that since we're going backwards, we have to go back to how they say our roots. You know, putting the mask on, uh, continue to practice social distance in order for these numbers to go back down, because that's the only way that we was able to go into phase two because we was doing everything that we were supposed to do as a community, right? Don't you, don't you think you guys agree with that? You are exactly right. And I wish we would have emphasized that expect, at the expectation early on that this is going to be a constantly changing war against this virus. We're going to try some things. If we see a spike, if we see a population, if we see a business type that's having a problem, if we see an activity like football that's causing a spike, we will detect that in our contact investigation and we'll say, Hey, look, we got to back off from this. Go back to we're seeing. Just go back uh, to As long yeah. as everybody is flexible and understands what the game is here, that this is a, a data-driven scientific war against a brand new virus that 100% of us are susceptible to. We have never seen a truly novel virus uh, like this. That's, that's why the name novel uh, coronavirus is part of it, is this is not like the coronaviruses that cause colds and flu every year. This is brand new. Yeah. Nobody has right. any immunity to it. And so when 100% of people are immune, that's what I don't think that, you know, the, the numbers don't, don't really uh, uh, allow folks to see very easily how with, with this, the relatively small number of cases that, that we're seeing, even with that, our health, um, our health facilities could be overwhelmed. You know, if folks in the ER worry about a full moon, they worry about a bad night, they worry about a truck rollover or a bus crash, yeah. they worry about a mass casualty overwhelming what they got. Just imagine if 2% of us, if 5% of us develop COVID symptoms and have shortness of breath and need to go to the ER, we could easily, easily overwhelm the healthcare system in our region. Definitely. 
And so that's the thing I don't think people totally realize is that some people are advocating, well, let's just let this thing run its course. But, boy, you won't hear that from any doctors working in the ER. I guarantee you that. Absolutely. Dr. Wilson, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I agree. As someone who worked in the ER, you're absolutely correct. I mean, when people are coming in and you're having five and ten colds in an in a, in a hour, you just can't keep up with that demand. You can over a long period of time. But science has be, got to be the thing that drives it, as you mentioned earlier, data-driven decisions. And prevention. Yeah. Prevention. I mean, if and you mentioned it, uh, DJ Fab, the uh, people started doing uh, events. You know, when we, we started limiting the amount of gatherings, we saw a decrease. Yeah. You know, now we have all these super spreader events, people gathering more than 100, not wearing masks. So, you, you know, it's not rocket science. And the virus doesn't have a timetable. I don't know. Are you sending uh, emails to the virus well, saying, no, <laughs> <laughs> look, we're, we're, we want to have this gathering, don't come? I mean, you know, it, you, it, it just respects no, yeah, no yeah. political party, no, it, it, it's, it's never went away. Yeah. You know, as people keep saying we're going to move to the next phase or the third phase, we're not out of phase one. Yeah. As uh, Dr. Fauci said, we're knee deep and we're struggling for survival. And if the whole thing about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, if we do it and do it right on the front end, and had we done it right on the front end uh -huh. and not reopened too soon, then you wouldn't have to shut down a game. I mean, it's just insanity to keep doing the same thing. So uh, you have to be flexible, but you have to roll back. And uh, these events that have come up, these holidays have yeah. been, I mean, that it's a direct correlation to these super spread events and, and people not taking the precautions that we know work. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a proven fact. I mean, I right. mean, we saw the numbers go down. Absolutely. You know, and, and then as the, uh, the Mother's Day started coming around and graduations. graduations, then we saw the spike go up. So, I mean, it's like, like you said, it's not a rocket science to take, you know, it, 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 you see that these masks and social distancing, washing your hands, this type of stuff works, you know? You have to have that Michael Jackson moment, I call it, that man or woman in the mirror. Yeah. I think everyone has to take that personal responsibility and and ask themselves, what can I do? What That old prayer serenity, what can you control? Yeah. Well, you can control wearing a mask, washing your hands, not going to, not visiting the establishment, says Mr. Kansas. I don't, you don't visit the establishment where you see people aren't wearing masks. Yeah. Vote with your feet. Yeah. Don't put yourself in harm's way. You're right about that, man. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Wills, we had a question for you. We had another you. question on Facebook? All right. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about uh, uh, if someone wants to get a test at Test Action Clinic, what do they need to do? Well, they just can call, and uh, if they think they're symptomatic, call ahead of time, and we'll greet them in the parking lot in their car and have our, our workers protected with the you know PPE, and we'll screen them. Um, if uh, they've been, uh, if they're one notified for contact tracing, we'll bring them in and test them also. Dr. Riggins alluded to earlier, we and I um, have the billboard, like you say in your medium, uh, coming soon. Uh, <laughs> we are involved in a, uh, a study that we're going to be rolling out. This, we can't give all the details because we don't know the date, but we've been chosen. Test Clinic is the only clinic in the state, the only pick five states uh, that we've gotten a grant from Centene where we will be doing testing both in the clinic and for the public. Okay. And um, that testing involves a long-term study uh, that Dr. Riggins talked about where we will be uh, making available at no cost to participants the nasal swab, which will tell you if you have active disease, and those that choose to participate in the study will be doing the blood draw to do the serology testing that to see if you have immunity or antibodies to the virus. Okay. So we're hoping in the next few weeks we'll get the details worked out, and this will be confined to St. Mary Parish because the, the study was uh, limited to that, um, and it's going to be a thousand test kits, uh, and we've been talking to the different venues to roll it out in St. Mary Parish, starting in Franklin, Patterson, and then in Morgan City, but details to follow. That's what's up, man. We thank you all so much. We have another question, Howard? Or? Uh, just a lot of people congratulating both of you for the work that you do in the area. Definitely. We definitely want to congratulate both of these young men, uh, Dr. Gary Wills and Dr. Chip Regis, man. Thank you guys so much. You just don't know how important it was for you guys to be here today and just kind of relieve our peoples and then also stress to them how important it is to put those masks on and, and, and to protect yourselves while you're out there in the public. I have another question though for Dr. Riggins. Does the state have any research on people that have had it, have recovered, and then have gotten, gotten it back again? Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's why the study that Dr. Wilkes is talking about is so important, is because we're seeing this for the first time. There's some anecdotal cases of folks. It's kind of hard to tell right now if they relapsed or if they truly recovered and then got a new exposure or were they never completely over the virus last time. Mm. We're going to have to study it. I'm going to be the first person to, to say we don't know everything about this virus. It's brand new. So uh, things th this virus does not ha behave the same way that, that most viruses do. And so uh, I think anybody that says they know is really just taking a leap of faith. And right now, as Dr. Will said, we need to do some better science so we can actually answer that question uh, better and have data to, to, to back it up. But we should not assume right now there's nothing to say that if you've had COVID before, that you have lifelong immunity. It's not like other diseases where uh, that's a guarantee. This is not a guarantee at all. We need to study that. I have a feeling that when the vaccine is available, we're gonna tell people, even if you had COVID-19, even if you had a positive test, please get the vaccine because anything to increase your immunity and to lessen the likelihood that you'll ever get it back, um, you should do. So I think even the vaccine will be promoted among high-risk people, even if they had and recovered from COVID-19. And, and in that vein, I'm gonna encourage everyone to get their flu vaccines and get them early. As soon as they get out, we're gonna do that. And if you are uh, of the age where you need to get the, the pneumovax or the pneumonia shot, okay. please get that done to protect yourself against at least those two entities. That's what's up. Hey, before we get out of here, I want you guys to talk to that age group 18 to 35 what is it that you want them to know and really get about this virus? You know, the younger folks that's out there throwing the parties, that's out there feeling like they're, you know, just, just you know, could do whatever they want. Some of the young people that we've spoken to, uh, they, they say that when they see something open, their assumption is that if something is open, that it must be safe. And... Again, things are open right now in phase two, but, but that's open contingent on social distancing, mm -hmm. masking, washing of hands. That's not open well for just like normal times, no mask, no social distancing. So I think that's a key thing for them to realize is that some of these venues, and I know I have young people, uh, two, I have two college age sons, and uh, uh, restaurants a big part of their life it's a big part of their social life and restaurants are back open but that's a caveat there is there's a there's a limitation you see the seats marked you can't just pack the restaurant like we once did mm -hmm. and it's dependent on masking as much as possible not going there if you're ill not going there if you're in quarantine not going there if you're in isolation correct so just because you feel okay and and just because a place is open doesn't mean that, that you should necessarily be there. Uh, it's still a matter of take those precautions. And I would just implore them to, to realize that this is their generation. And once again, most people, including people of that age group, are really trying to do their best to be a part of the solution here. And we should be thanking those folks as much as worrying about those that are, that are really um, uh, making some bad choices right now yeah. based on some bad information. Uh, I really don't want to get sucked down too far down the road of, 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 of scolding folks, but I think we've done a great job this afternoon of helping them be aware of their responsibility to their loved ones and the rest of the community. And that generation takes great pride in, in being a part of the community. So I think that'll work. That's what's up. Dr. Wilson, that younger, old, yeah, yeah, younger just, generation, <laughs> message for them. The message I don't want them to have is the one that uh, you're familiar with as a DJ, the, the famous New Orleans song. Do what you want. Yeah, or, yeah. No, <laughs> don't do what you want. Or, okay. But more do like Spike Lee, do the right thing. There you go. And you know what the right thing is because we're telling you what the right thing to do is. You know, wear a mask. Don't go to COVID parties and don't put people at risk. Yeah. Putting yourself at risk or others. You know, show some love. I mean, you know it's in your heart. And, and I think for the most part, most people are doing it. But just do the right thing. That's what's up. Doctors, I thank you guys so much for your time, for coming on through. Uh, Dr. Chip Riggins. Uh, Dr. Chip, also name some of the uh, parishes that you cover uh, with the Region 3. Uh, all the same parishes as with Dr. Wilkes, uh, the River Parishes, St. Charles, St. John, St. James, Assumption, Terrebonne, Lafouche, 
in St. Mary. So it's the seven parishes here in the Bayou River parishes. That's what's up. That's region three. Hey, you guys, thank you all so much for coming on through and just giving our public uh, some great information and dealing with this COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Wills, once again, want to congratulate you on being selected uh, with Governor Edwards with the task force uh, and doing a great job with that. And uh, you guys be safe out there and thank you guys for everything you do, Prosper. Thank you all so much. Hey, thank you. That's what's up, y'all.